It's always a great joy and an honor for me to preach here at Faith. My mind goes back many years ago when I preached my first sermon here at Faith in the little building that is now gone just a few feet from here. And I preached more times there than I can remember. And I've preached more times here than I can remember. It is a great joy to preach the gospel. I'm not as young as I used to be, of course. And I don't preach as much as I did in the past. I pastored the same church for 50 plus years. And so I've had a long tenure of preaching. I realize that I am no longer able to preach in a pastoral situation. In my mind, I, I believe I, I can. And I would like to try it sometime. Not, I'm not applying to be the pastor here. And don't misunderstand me. But the gospel never changes. Churches change. Preachers change. People change. The world changes. But God never changes. I want to preach for just a few minutes today a line of truth that I trust will strengthen you in the Lord. Some time ago, I preached a sermon here that I've preached in a lot of places entitled, Life's Most Important Question, Do I Know Jesus Christ as My Personal Lord and Savior? The question is not, am I a church member? Or have I been baptized? Or am I a good person? The question is, do I know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior? Have I met him on the terms of the gospel? That is to repent and believe the gospel. And that is the most important question today. That's not my sermon, but I am responsible for asking you this question again. And I want you to examine your heart right now. And if you can go back to a time and place where you did meet the Lord redemptively and in salvation, I want you to take just a few moments and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and so free. And if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I urge you to come to Christ. He is a wonderful Savior. And he came into this world to save sinners. That is the gospel. That is the good news. So ere you leave this building today, and certainly ere you close your eyes and sleep tonight, I urge you, if you do not know the Lord, to come to him in repentance and in faith. Now, I know a lot about Faith Baptist Church. And I know a lot about many of the people of Faith Baptist Church. But I'm not here to preach about Faith Baptist Church or what it has 
been or what it has experienced, except to say I am aware that these are troubled days for Faith Baptist Church. And unless you're not paying attention, you are naive or you are dumb or just plain stupid or you just arrived this morning from another planet, I'm here to tell you that this is a troubled world. This is a new day. We have never had to deal with what we are dealing with or faced with today. This is a day of change. In my generation, it took a generation for things to change. That is, about 40 years, things were pretty well static. But that's not true anymore. Things can change several times in this world and in this nation between breakfast and lunch. Things change so fast we can't keep up with them. And I want you to remember this. You as an individual and you as a family, not only your immediate family, but your extended family, your larger family. And this family of faith here at Faith Baptist Church is under the target of Satan and the demons of hell. God wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy this family of faith. That's just realistic. And it's foolish to close our eyes and to hide our head, as it were, in the sand and say, I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to acknowledge Satan or the real world. I'm just going on and have fun and enjoy life. It will never be that way, my friends. But in light or in spite of everything that I've just described, I'm here to declare to you that God has not changed since the day I was born or since the day you were born or since the day this church began. God has not changed. And let's go back a little farther. God hasn't changed since Genesis 1 and 1 that declares in the beginning God. God has not changed. God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. And God is I'm not righteous. And that brings me to one scripture that I will use as a springboard in these few minutes that's allotted to me. We're all familiar with Hebrews chapter 11 that is known as the faith chapter of the Bible. That chapter begins with a very simple yet profound definition of faith. And when faith is referenced in this chapter, it is a spiritual faith, not a human faith, not a natural faith. Let me me illustrate. We walked in this building and sat down on one of these pews. Our human faith said 
this pew is or will sustain my weight. We, we drove here in an automobile and we said with human faith, natural faith, I believe I can drive this automobile and I believe that it will obey my directions when I turn the steering wheel or when I press the gas pedal or when I press the brake pedal. That's my faith. That's natural human faith. But that's not the faith that Hebrews 11 is talking about. It is a spiritual faith. And it is necessary that you keep that in mind. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. Now, both grace and faith are gifts of God. God extends his unmerited, unearned, undeserved grace. And accompanying that grace is faith. For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. That is, faith is a gift of God. No man can exercise a natural, humanistic, intellectual faith and say, well, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Bible, and be saved. It's even, even the devil believes what I just said, but he's, of course, not saved. And so, it is a spiritual faith. And I want us to look at one verse of Scripture. It would take me far more time than I have here if I took all day long to develop the truths in this chapter. So this verse will be used merely as a springboard. I want you to look at verse number 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe, look at it now, why not just draw a circle around those words? Believe that he is. Not that he was, and thank God he was. Not that he will be, thank God he will be, but the declaration is that he is present tense. And not only is God in the present tense, but that he, that is God, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then the chapter proceeds to give us examples of those who sought the Lord and were rewarded by faith. Now let's go back at the beginning of this verse. But without faith, that is, without believing. John 3.16 tells us about believing. And that word believe is trust in, rely on, and cling to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. That's what believing is. Trusting in, relying on, and clinging to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the last time I preached here, I used as a springboard verse of scripture in uh, Second. Chronicles chapter, Chronicles chapter 28, I believe it is. Let me, uh, let me see if I can, let's just turn over there. No, it's, it, it's 1 Chronicles 28. And uh, 
here in this, in this chapter, we, we find a declaration. Let me see if I can find it here. I should have marked it down and, uh, and uh, let me see, let me see. Well, I, yeah, let me see. Hold on. First, First Chronicles chapter uh, 28. And uh, there, there is the declaration of, of the God of the Bible. Can someone find that verse for me? Well, here it is. They left it in the Bible. It's, it's still here. <laughs> First uh, Chronicles chapter 28 it is uh, beginning at verse number 10 wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation and David said listen to it carefully blessed be thou Lord God of Israel our father forever and ever Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great, and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise Thy glorious name. Oh my. What a powerful section of scripture. I trust that you will emphasize those few verses that we have just read. And I want you to remember these verses when you reflect on Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh must believe, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, etc. So this is the God that the writer to the Hebrews is referring to, the God of the Bible. Now, as I said just a few moments ago, this is a day of unprecedented change. In fact, things are changing so fast we can't keep up with them. I, I stand amazed at uh, the, the new technology. And uh, everybody's got a, got a phone, haven't they? Everybody. I we'll go into a restaurant occasionally and we see a family sitting at the table. And uh, th there was a time, at home at least, and occasionally when we went out to eat, it was family time. On, and uh, we, we talked to one another and the kids talked to one another. But, but they're not doing that anymore. They're doing this. And my little grandkids and my, even my great-grandkids, they know more about those iPhones than I can even imagine. And I'm still working on how to turn it on an awful lot of times and how to do other simple things. And my little great-grandchildren would say to me sometime when I ask them a question about something of how to manipulate the phone and, and, and they'll say, 
well, Pops, that's very easy, or that's very simple. Well, just keep your thoughts to yourself, kid. I mean, I, I, I'm not as intelligent as you are or knowledgeable as you are about this. I stand amazed. I, I, I publish a, an internet paper called the Wake Up Herald, and it goes all over the world. And I'm amazed at how I can, I can sit there and with my keyboard and my, my monitor, I can talk to someone in England or Switzerland or Germany or Argentina instantly. I'm still trying to figure out how they get these jet planes off the end of the runway out there. And here I am talking to people on the other side of the world. But listen, this God that this Bible is telling us about is far more powerful than what I've just described digitally. I, 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 Someone provides for me the Atlanta Journal-Constitution digital version. I'm absolutely amazed. Every time I look at it, I can't, I can't imagine how in this world they do all of this. So the change is here. And we are affected by this mentally. And we translate this over into the arena of faith. No, my friends, God is still on his throne. God hasn't moved. Will you mark this down on the fly leaf of your mind? There are no accidents with God. There are no tragedies with God. God is never too late. God is always right. So our responsibility is to find out which way the Redeemer's going and get in behind him and follow him as closely as we possibly can. I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 1. And I want us to remember these words. They're very simple. And they're very easily to remember, very easily to memorize. In the beginning, God. Now that's where we must begin on every subject of life. We must always begin with God. What does God say about this? And God says something about everything that affects our life or that affects our family. So we need to find out what God says. Will you remember this, please? God will tell you where you can work and where you cannot work. God will tell you, et cetera, et cetera, all of life, all of life. In the beginning, God. Now, let's turn to John chapter 1. And I want us to read these familiar words. In the beginning was the Word. Now that's singular. In the beginning was the Word. And then there's a description of the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, you don't have to go to seminary to understand that, do you? You don't have to have a 
degree in theology to understand that. Now, verse number two, the same was in the beginning with God. So when we read Genesis 1 and 1, we're reading about Jesus because he was in the beginning with God. And as I said, when I began speaking this morning, Jesus Christ is God. You see, we didn't change gods between Malachi and Matthew. Amen. Amen. The same God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Amen. And he has chosen to reveal himself in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The incarnation, that is God becoming man is the greatest miracle of all miracles. No one can understand it. No one can really comprehend it. But it is the truth of the gospel. And there is no gospel apart from the incarnation. Verse number three, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, the gospel is very simple. God's law is very simple. It's not always easy, and it's not always easy to comprehend. But everyone can understand, thou shalt not steal. I was taught that in the beginner Sunday school class, along with all of the commandments of the Lord. Did you know when I was in public school, and that was my educational experience, public schools, when I was in kindergarten, when I was in the first grade, on up through high school, do you know one of the things that was framed on the wall of every classroom, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Usually there was a picture of George Washington, but there were the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments are no longer allowed in the government schools. There are no public schools, they're all government schools. And uh, they're not locally controlled, they're federally controlled. So the Ten Commandments are not allowed in there. Hey, the Ten Commandments, for all practical purposes, are not allowed in many Baptist churches either, or any church by any other name. Now, I want to concentrate just a few moments on this word, word. It's capitalized in your Bible, word. Not words. In the beginning, there was the words. I slaughter the English language in more ways than I can uh, be comfortable with. And I don't know everything about grammar as I, I need to know, but in publishing a paper on the internet, I, I follow to the best of my ability the rules of grammar and punctuation. Did it ever occur to you that there are only 26 letters in the English alphabet? Just 26. And that's one of the first things you learn as a, as a little child. 
The first thing you learn is how to count. One, two, three, four. And if you count it up to 10, you were really making progress. But the next, the next thing that you were taught, at least I was taught, and I'm reasonably certain you were taught also, was the alphabet. Your parents or your older sibling taught you the alphabet. A, and, and you could sing it, That's, uh, that made it easier. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And, and I, I, I remember how much fun I had with my little grandchildren and uh, encouraging them to repeat the alphabet. 26 letters. Do you know what those 26 letters can do? They constitute words. You put those letters together and you make words out of them. Did it ever occur to you how many words there are as a result of those 26 letters? Yes. Well, there's very little agreement by the experts as to how many words there are. There are some that say there's a quarter of a million. There are others that say, no, there's 500,000. But hey, I, I saw, a, 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 and I reviewed it just recently, a, a very reputable site that said that there are 1,227,000 words in the English language. Think about that. Now, that uh, I'm, 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 I'm not going to test it to see. I'm not going to start now counting them one by one. I just know that there are a lot of words out there. Now, what are words? Words are vehicles of communication. You communicate with words. That is, you understand what is being said by a common definition of the words that are being used. Now, if two people are talking and they use words that they don't understand to mean the same thing or have the same meaning, they could talk all day and all night long and not communicate. You have to have a definition of the word or words that are being used if you're going to communicate to someone or if someone is going to communicate with you, there must be a common agreement about the words. Take what I've just said and apply it to John chapter 1. In the beginning was what? The Word. Not the words, but the Word. Hey, Jesus Christ, the living Word, is the golden thread that runs from Genesis 1-1 to the last chapter of the book of Revelation and the last verse. This Bible is about God as He is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord commands in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word. Not preach the words, but preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That is the function of the Lord's church. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And I want you to underscore 
this verse. Listen to it now. Read it with me. For the word of God is quick. And that word quick means alive. The word of God is alive <coughs> and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, that is the natural and the spiritual, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's easy to understand why the Word of God is hated and despised and rejected by a large segment of the world. Now, Jesus said, listen to what Jesus said now. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Not a natural ear, but a spiritual ear. And the direct way to the spiritual ear is through the hearing of the natural ear, of course. You know how many times he said this? He that hath an ear, let him hear. He said this 15 times, including seven times to the church in Revelation. Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to follow along. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, he's not talking about salvation because we cannot do anything to constitute salvation. He that he's talking about the process of sanctification here. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, draw a circle around that word doeth, and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for why? It was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain, rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. My friends, the question is not if the storm will come. The question is, when will the storm come? And the storm is headed for your life. The storm is headed for your family. And the storm is headed for this church. And for every church that preaches the truth of the gospel. And you've already experienced storms. I'm asking, are you committed to standing to the truth of God's word? Are you founded on the rock? That's an important question here. Yes, yes. Now, I conclude with this verse in Hosea chapter 4. A verse that I believe describes America as well as any verses in the Bible, and there are many that I could refer to, but I've selected this one. Hosea chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. 
Hear the word of the Lord. And that's what God is saying to you and to Faith Baptist Church afresh. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. And because there is no truth, no mercy, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. What a description of a nation. And I believe that it clearly describes America. Now, I often tell people what, and I've traveled all across America, preached in churches and Bible conferences over and over again, and this is the most common question I'm asked. Brother Bob, what do you believe is the most serious problem in America? That's a serious question, isn't it? And my response is, number one, there is no fear of God Amen. before the eyes of the people. Will you underscore that statement? There is no fear of God before the eyes of the people. And number two, Every man doeth that which is right in his own eyes. Those are the two most serious problems. What is God saying to faith this morning? Put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand against the stratagems of Satan. You say, Brother Bob, I have on the whole armor of God. Well, praise God. I commend you that you have on the whole armor of God. But I want you to take a look at it with your spiritual eyes and polish it up day by day. Yea, hour by hour. Amen. He that cometh to God, what? Must what? Believe. That is, trust in, rely on, and cling to God. <coughs> and that is my challenge to you today. God is still God. Amen. Heavenly Father, take these few words in this message today and stamp it indelibly upon the hearts, not just the intellect, but the hearts of the hearers. And I pray your blessing upon everyone that's here today. And I pray your blessings upon those who will hear this message through a recording. I pray that you will speak to all hearers. And I pray, Lord, that this property will be encamped with heavenly angels. I pray that you will protect the property, protect this building. But Lord, most important, I pray that you will protect the people, their families. I pray, Lord, for each member. Not only your blessings on them physically, but your blessings on them spiritually. I pray, Lord, that they will continue to look to you I pray that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that they will 
find it in their heart to make a new commitment to you in contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.